Okay, let's get started. So what we've done thus far in the course is the first half we spent learning some fundamentals of quantum mechanics. Uh, we then talked about what would happen if we had a very large number of quantum particles and we developed some distribution functions. Now what we want to do is put that large number of particles into a container, which we will call a solid, and try to develop the simplest theory of a solid. <coughs> so we finally come to the point uh, where we're talking about material science. It took a while to get here. And the first model we're going to develop is known as free electron theory. The assumption is that if you have a metal, the conduction electrons are free to move relatively freely throughout that metal. And as a result, the simplest potential you could imagine writing down to describe that situation would be one where the potential is zero everywhere except at the walls of that solid. So we call this free electron theory because the electrons are free to move within the solid, but they're still bound, of course, by the walls of the solid. So this will represent the simplest possible theory we could develop for a solid, known as free electron theory. And in this theory, we assume that the electrons in a solid experience no forces except at the impenetrable walls of the solid. And as a result, the potential, which is of course three-dimensional potential, will be equal to zero if we assume the solid is uh, existing in the x coordinate between 0 and L sub x, between 0 and L sub y in the y coordinate, and between 0 and L sub z in the z coordinate, so that's where the solid is located in space, there's no potential there, and infinity otherwise. This is obviously an oversimplification of a solid, because in addition to the electrons, there are also the nuclei. Okay, so we're going to have to add the nuclei later. In, real, in reality, there's not going to be zero potential, but at least a periodic potential from the atoms in the crystal. So we're going to have to add periodicity later. And then finally, of course, there are defects present in solids, and those defects will lead to further chances for the electrons to interact with the solid or the nuclei themselves. In addition, the electrons could interact with one another. And what we're going to do is move through the remainder of the course, adding more and more complexity. And if you take 451, we'll add even more complexity to develop a more and more accurate model of the solid. But we begin simply by assuming this is the case. The good news about this potential is that we've already solved it. This is a particle in a box. And the allowed energies are defined with respect to three quantum numbers, n sub x, n sub y, n sub z, and is equal to pi squared h bar squared over 2m times n sub x squared over l sub x squared for the x component. Remember how we would solve this problem is to do separation of variables and Cartesian coordinates, plus n sub y squared over l sub y squared, which would come out of the y coordinate, plus n sub z squared over l sub z squared, which will come from the z coordinate. What we're going to do to try to equate this back to the theory of free particles, remember that was the first potential we solved from, with the Schrodinger equation, we're going to let this be equal to h bar squared k squared over 2m. The reason why we're doing this is that the electrons in the solid, except at the boundaries, feel no potential, and so they're effectively free. We're going to find that the free particle solution is going to be applicable to electrons and solids with some constraints. But in an attempt to try to correlate the real energies with the free particle solution, we're going to define it, or we're going to introduce this parameter k. If you recall, the energy of a free particle is just h bar squared k squared over 2m. But now we can see exactly what k is equal to in a solid. So we're introducing k, where k 
is the magnitude of the wave vector the wave vector of course is k vector and we'll have three components kx ky kz where we can see by inspection of this equation compared to that equation that kx y and z are equal to pi n sub x y and z divided by l x y and z where of course the quantum numbers for the particle in a box are positive integers. So if you recall for a truly free particle, k was a continuous variable. It could have any, it could have any solution you want. In a solid, it is going to be quantized. But the spacing between the wave vectors is going to be very small because these dimensions here are macroscopic in size, centimeter as opposed to angstroms. So the energy difference is going to be very, very small. And as a result, this will effectively be a continuous variable. And so the approximation will be very similar to that of a free particle. The difference is that it is quantized, and there is a finite number of available wave vectors, and so we're going to have to define a density of states, and that's where we're going today. Okay. So what does this tell us? In our effort to define or calculate the density of states, what I want you to do is imagine plotting a series of planes in this k dimension, or as we'll call it, k space. So I want to show you a, a picture of, of k space in this problem. So k space, of course, is three dimensions, kx, ky, and kz. You know, if we were to draw in planes at kx equal to pi over lx, 2 pi over lx, 3 pi over lx, etc. If we were to plot planes for ky equal to pi over ly, 2, 2 pi over ly, etc. And k sub z to be pi over l sub z, 2 pi over l sub z, etc. Then we would get this plot here. The intersection of any three planes will of course be an allowed wave vector, right? Because the wave vector is quantized. And the only available quantum numbers are n sub x, n sub y, and n sub z equal to one, two, three, et cetera. So each of these points represents a discrete state in k space. And so a fair question to ask is how much volume of k space is taken up by one state? And so that's the shaded box here. As we know from you know, introductory material science, if we were to calculate the number of, of atoms in a unit cell, or in this case, the number of states inside of this box, we see that there are eight corners to this uh, rectangular prism. And of course, each of them share that state with eight others. And as a result, we're going to have one eighth times eight, or one state in that box. The volume of that box, we can calculate directly, is just going to be equal to uh, the spacing between the states, which is pi over Lx in the x direction, pi over LZ in the Y direction, and pi over L sub Z in the Z direction. And so the volume of this will just be pi cubed divided by LX, LY, LZ. So we can write down from this diagram directly what the volume per state is in K space. Is everybody comfortable with this picture here? This is a picture you want to keep in your mind. because uh, we're going to utilize this to derive the so-called density of states. Again, for material scientists, this is usually no problem because in courses as early as 201, you learn how to do the state counting. So from this purely geometrical argument, we can see that each state represents, or I should say each state occupies, 
a k space volume which is pi cubed over lx, ly, lz. Of course, lx times ly times lz is just the real space volume of the solid. And as a result, the standard to write this as pi cubed over v, where v is the real space volume. Okay. A common problem in free electron theory is to reanalyze the problem in some reduced dimensionality system, like a 2D system, which would represent a thin film, or a 1D system, which would represent a, a nanowire, for example. And obviously, if you had a 2D system, you'd only have nx squared over lx squared plus ny squared over ly squared. And so you'd have a two-dimensional k space. And as a result, the volume, or in that case, the area in k space per state would be pi squared divided by lx times ly. Similarly, in 1D, you would just have a length, which would be pi over l sub x. And if you wanted, you could generalize this to a higher dimensionality system if you wanted, although that's probably less realistic physically. So this is really the fundamental point. There's one other thing we need to recognize. And that is, let's consider the case of t equals zero Kelvin first. If these free particles were bosons or distinguishable particles, So at t equals zero, bosons are distinguishable particles would settle. To the ground state, which of course is where nx, ny, and nz are equal to one. So they would collapse, they would condense, if you will. And this is the so-called Bose-Einstein condensate. But of course in a solid, we don't have bosons, we have fermions. So however, electrons are fermions, that obey the Pauli exclusion principle. And as a result, only two electrons, and there's two, of course, because the Schrodinger equation does not include spin, and we now know that there's two possible values of spin for a fermion, so only two electrons can occupy each state. And as a result, if we were to pour electrons into a solid, they would, of course, occupy the lowest state, which would be psi 1, 1 first, and you'd be able to put two into that state, but then you'd begin to fill up larger values of nx, ny, and z, and as a result, larger values of kx, ky, and kz. Of course, they're going to want to occupy the lowest energies first, and as a result, they're going to fill up to a value which minimizes the magnitude of k. So if you imagine in k space some radial vector k, anything under that vector k is going to be filled up before you go above that vector k. So you're going to fill up k space in a spherical manner, and as a result, what we're going to define is some wave vector, which we'll call k sub f, which we know as the Fermi wave vector, which will represent the boundary between the occupied and the unoccupied states at t equals zero Kelvin. What we'll then do is turn on temperature, and obviously we'll have the possibility of promoting states thermally to values greater.